to start with you on the environment here for a minute because there is a lot of conversation about how difficult it can be to short in this market, particularly whether you call it a melt up, whether you call it a bull market. It, it, you certainly see even um, the unprofitable names or even some of the potentially troubled names moving higher. How do you feel? <laughs> it's never been a good time to be a short seller, I suppose. But um, a lot of what drives stocks these days, and your your previous guest was, guest was talking about factors, and that's the thing. It's really so much of what moves stocks is really just flows into and out of index funds, so mainly into index funds. So as a short seller, you have to be attuned to that and really you have to stay away from names that have significant passive ownership because effectively that just shrinks the supply of the stock and when you have inflows into those passive funds they will buy those at any price so that is something that has warped the environment and caused a disconnect between fundamentals and the prices of the stocks Carson, that's really interesting. It, we heard something similar uh, from David Einhorn talking about how these passive flows have sort of just fundamentally changed markets. I do want to bring you some sound from our interview with Jim Chanos a month ago uh, on the close. He had some interesting things to say about the state of short selling. I've called this the golden age of fraud. So there's just so many companies, <laughs> oh, wow. so many companies now to, that are playing games that are, that are to try and take advantage of investors. So we need short sellers more than ever. The golden age of fraud, of course, Jim Chanos' perspective that we need short sellers more than ever. But talk to me about the fundraising environment. I mean, is there investor demand for those short sellers? Well, when I began raising money, um, so I was first an activist short seller, didn't have a fund, and then we launched. And my initial conversations, so we're talking 2014, 2015, were a lot, a lot of them flowed in the following way, which is, oh, you know, we're... We're concerned about the valuations. We're concerned about the market. We want short exposure, but we just don't want to lose money when the market goes up. And it's like, well, you can't really have it both ways, guys. And um, since then, um, the environment's only gotten worse. I mean, Jim, you know, Jim has shut down his hedge funds um, because, yeah, investors investors don't want to pay the price for that insurance policy. That is your traditional short selling strategy um they don't you know they don't care about alpha and you know i'd say that also one of the things to jim's point about the golden age of fraud yes i there are more companies playing more games you know a lot of them are in the gray zone you don't know whether it's over the line or not so they're not going to get prosecuted in this environment um and some are over the line but you know, I think that 2013 was a tipping point where on the long side, investors stopped being remunerated for caring about risk. And it became just about buying narrative. And so the long side investors who didn't make that transition, who still cared about risk, well, they became the butt of jokes or were derided as value investors. And I think that that's one of the transitions that David Einhorn went through was realizing that you have to look at things differently than you know than you used to um so that's that's the problem like yes the market needs more short sellers more than ever given the amount of games that are being played but if the long side doesn't care then you know this can continue until it doesn't basically so, so carson that's the sort of markets explanation i wonder about the um political issue because during the Biden administration, the Department of Justice and the SEC have opened investigations into short sellers accusing them of market manipulation. You would think that the Democrats should appreciate, you know, speaking truth to power, holding corporate America accountable, pulling back the curtain and showing that it's not a wizard. It's a dude back there, you know? So do you expect anything different if we were to have uh, a second Trump administration or do all politicians hate short sellers? Well, it's interesting because when, so just small correction in, nobody has been accused of market manipulation yet. So to, no, to be fair. No, just investigations um, though, but, right, have been open. Yeah, so. But, yeah, so I mean, look, we were, 
you know, we received subpoenas and, you know, search warrant uh, back in 2021, which, um, yeah, that's a day that, you know, I'm sure my then eight-year-old son will never forget. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've got a, you know, I've got a real personal issue with, with this. But I think one of, one of the things that I, re that I realized was at the SEC, when they were making these cases in 2010 to 2013-ish, uh, based on work that activist short sellers had done, well, a lot of those people left the agency, and they now bill $2,300 an hour working for big law firms. So I'm not sure that the agency has much of an institutional memory of how helpful short sellers have been to it. Mm -hmm. And when you look on the whistleblower side, um, you know, there's that SEC whistleblower program, it seems that the SEC is now trying to actually, you know, contrary to the law, there's there's no law that states you're differently situated if you're a short seller versus company insider who's blowing the whistle. But it seems like the SEC is trying to make it harder for whistleblowers to actually get paid uh, when the SEC has recovery. So right. I chalk it up to no institutional memory, number one. And number two, there's this populism, right? There's political populism, but that's infiltrated the markets. Mm -hmm. And I think Elon Musk is really the first to recognize that in the markets and use that to push Tesla up. But I think that, that part of that populist message, it's easy to demonize short sellers right. as part of the populist message and somehow call us the suits. Well, you know, that was a really weird moment in 21 when that started happening. Well, Carson, wrapping it all together, I mean, you think about the regulatory overhang, the political demonization, it sounds like you'd call it, of short sellers, and then the fact that you have those market dynamics, all of the, that passive money coming in. I mean, do you see the short selling industry shrinking from here? What's the outlook? Well, you have to differentiate the traditional short sellers who are not talking about the stocks they're short, and they're typically going to be short 50 to 80 names for fundamental reasons, melting ice cubes from what we do, which is we look for companies that have been generally you know, gra gravely misrepresenting the information they give to investors, if not outright lying. Mm -hmm. um, I think the former, um, that's a very difficult business right now because, um, you know, it's just, it, there, again, there's, there's this inclination to buy narratives and allocators don't really want to lose money um, waiting for, you know, paying for this, that insurance policy. For what we do, the, there's still, uh, as Jim makes clear, right, there are plenty of companies that are problematic. The, you know, the question always is, is whether investor apathy, you know, investors in a given name, whether they're so apathetic that the problems that we find won't matter to them. And Carson. when you have an environment in which there's no enforcement, mm -hmm. that contributes to it. Carson, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about sectors because you have been clearly targeting certain areas and one of very high interest to investors right now that is the commercial real estate market. You've had this short when it comes to BXMT, Blackstone's Mortgage Trust, and it has been down about 10 percent on the year. Clearly, you've made some money. But to what end are you looking to short this stock? They say they have $1.7 billion of liquidity. Uh, how much further are you going to go here? Well, our thesis from when we unveiled it in December of last year is that in the second half of this year, BXMT is going to cut the dividend. So we're generally not forward looking in what we do, but our BXMT short is different. And it was based on this information asymmetry. We got a hold of CLO data, so CLO loan data, which there's that's apparently emblematic uh, BXMT's um, CLOs of what's on BXMT's balance sheet. So, I mean, a lot of these loans are in trouble. They're, you know, BXMT has not trued them up in terms of the risk ratings. So we believe that as more and more of these loans are allowed to pick, pay in kind, that in the second half of this year, BXMT is going to have to cut the dividend. So that's what we're playing for in that short. 
So if you think about what's happening now and this idea that you could see an interest rate cut, does that make the situation simpler for BXMT and other REITs? Do you think that this is a trade that you would continue into other areas, this higher for longer uh, pressure on loan books trade? So when in December, when we went public with this, I mean, our view was that unless there were a roughly 300 basis point drop in SOFR within the next month or two, this the BXMT would have to cut the dividends. So we've seen no decline, we've seen no decrease in SOFR. And, you know, maybe you're going to get, what, a 25 basis point cut, um, you know, bef before the end of the year, maybe 50 basis points. It doesn't matter. Um, in, in our view, because the problem is the, the borrowers had been protected from the interest rate rises because they put into place these, they call rate caps. They're effectively interest rate swaps. And as those swaps burned off um, last year and are burning off this year, now they're exposed to the much higher interest rates. So that's what we think is the straw that's going to break the camel's back here. What do you think about banks? Shanali's had a banner day um, with the big ones. Are there any that you would short, especially those that are exposed a lot to commercial real estate or multifamily? Man, well, look, that's, well, certainly there are some regional banks that, um, that could be interesting. Um, in the past, in 2016, we were short uh, Bank OZK, which has a lot of exposure basically to niche CRE doing construction lending. Now, at that time, it was also partly to say, look, this is trading at two and a half times book because everybody right. thinks there's no risk here. It's such a great bank. I'm not current on that one, but right. if one were inclined, I would look at that.